Okay, welcome to the first talk in the 2023-2024 Hottest series. We started Hottest almost six years ago now, and it's great to, to see lots of uh, familiar faces and lots of new faces as well. Uh, this week's speaker is Nikolai Kutisov from Innopolis University, and his title is the Rust Proof Assistant and Simplicial Hot Formalization. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, very honored. Um, and uh, so I, I should say that uh, this talk, um, I tried to talk to fit in uh, a lot of the things here, and uh, some of some of them didn't get it into the talk, uh, probably for good. But maybe there's still too much that I'm trying to say. So um, uh, you, uh, I, I would invite uh, everyone to ask questions during the talk, not just after the talk. Maybe that will make it a bit more uh, interesting, um, and will highlight the, the important points that I would would like to, to, to make in this uh, talk. And uh, so this is about the RCK proof assistant and also about the formalization that we've done uh, in, with uh, with Emily and Jonathan and also recently with more collaborators uh, using the proof assistant. So um, uh, I will first try to very briefly uh, outline the context uh, in which RZK exists. Uh, and uh, to, to give a general impression. And then uh, I, I want to uh, go through uh, the basics of simplicial type theory using the syntax of RZK. Uh, then I would like to talk about this specific uh, formalization project that we went through with Emily and Jonathan and uh, what it uh, has been evolving into recently. Um, finally, I would just touch up uh, about the development of RZK just a little bit. I was initially hoping to to, uh, to sort of talk a little bit more about uh, the implementation and the ideas that uh, of how it should be implemented, but I've, uh, I'm trying to restrain myself on that in this talk. Um, yeah, and uh, that, that's basically the outline uh, of this talk. Right, so let's start with RZK in context. So we start by remembering that uh, there are various mathematical theories and some of them are, uh, well, all of them probably are uh, sufficiently complicated if you get deep enough. But uh, specifically here, we're interested in category theory or homotopy theory. And uh, I heard that it's very hard to reason directly in category theory and homotopy theory in particular in higher uh, in higher ones. Uh, now I have to say explicitly that I do not actually do uh, 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 analytic category theory, uh, if you would call that myself. So I only know that this is really difficult, mostly from other people such as uh, Emily or uh, Benedict Arens. Uh, but uh, I'm told that it is really difficult because, well, there are, first of all, different models of, um, of, for example, infinity category theory. And so uh, that's one complication. But also whenever you need to uh, check uh, coherence conditions like uh, related to associativity, for example, uh, in higher category theories that would require coherence checks on multiple levels and possibly even infinitely many ones. So uh, synthetic theories uh, here allow to internalize some of these arguments uh, in such a way that proofs become easier. So some of the arguments that, that are uh, commonly occurring uh, in those uh, more general, let's say, analytic theories. And then some of these synthetic theories also allow uh, for uh, automatic uh, uh, or for, for some sort of automation and usually uh, we call those uh, tools that allow uh, automatically check certain things in synthetic theories, proof assistance. Um, so you can see here in this table, a sort of comparison uh, between homotopy theory and uh, category theory. So there is homotopy type theory uh, can be considered uh, or various, various uh, cubicle type theories 
could be seen as synthetic theories for homotopy theory. Uh, and uh, there are uh, synthetic uh, theories for um, category uh, for infinity category theory and uh, the one developed by uh, Emily Real and Michael Schulman is uh, one of the uh, is the one that uh, we're interested uh, in here. And uh, there are multiple tools. Um, so for homotopy type theory, there are first of all uh, formalized libraries in uh, different proof assistants like Unimat and Cog, Cubicle Agda. Uh, there is Unimath Agda, uh, oh, sorry, Agda Unimath, uh, in regular Agda. There are also lots of uh, experimental proof assistants for uh, cubicle type theory in particular. And so RZK here is like analogous to many of those, uh, but uh, uh, the different main difference is that it's uh, based on the synthetic theory for infinity categories. So uh, another uh, way to put uh, this work into context is uh, to look at uh, the, um, the, the journey towards uh, a directed type theory. So um, in, in this, uh, uh, this audience is, uh, I guess, very familiar with homotopy type theory. And here we have all types uh, in this theory are uh, interpreted, can be interpreted as infinity groupoids, also known as infinity zero categories. Um, and the identity types, the Martin Love identity types, uh, provide the infinity, group, infinity groupoid structure uh, for, for each type. Now, in simplicial homotopy type theory, at least the, the one that we work with um, in our ZK, is uh, uh, some types are uh, infinity categories, or more, more precisely infinity one categories, uh, but we still have the identity types like in HOT, which provide the infinity groupoidal structure. And in addition to that, separately, we have simplicial types that give rise to an independent higher structure, uh, which is not uh, exactly uh, the, the infinity categorical one, but if we uh, apply several conditions on on this uh, on this higher structure for a given type, uh, uh, then we can get pre-infinity categories first, uh, and then if we also connect those with um, with the uh, infinity groupoid structure that uh, the identity types provide, then we get uh, infinity one categories as a risk types in um, uh, in the simplicial type theory. And uh, so this is just basically one step from infinity zero categories. And as far as I understand, um, there is a quest to uh, get some time maybe uh, in the future to a fully directed type theory, uh, a theory where we could have uh, all or maybe some types that are uh, infinity infinity categories but as far as I know, there is no definitive theory uh, uh, for infinity infinity categories, or at least not a synthetic one. Um, but uh, in, for example, in, in the same paper where uh, Emily and Mike introduce, uh, introduce simplicial type theory, they suggest that maybe using different shapes as the uh, in their more general type theory, uh, more general setting of type theory with shapes, maybe that uh, should yield uh, theories uh, for infinity n and infinity infinity categories, and also they uh, they hint at the possibility of doing a version of cubicle uh, type theory in there, and even combining those theories together and uh, letting them interact in some way. So. Uh, yet another way to uh, look at the work is again to relate RZK with other proof assistants. And in particular, um, we can see that homotopy type theory is successfully formalized in many existing proof assistants already. So there's Unimath, uh, there's Agda Unimath, there's a library in Cubicle Agda, there is uh, Arendt proof assistant, uh, there is uh, even a formalization of homotopy type theory in Lean2. Uh, but unfortunately, recently, Lin has adopted uniqueness identity principle and 
uh, it is no longer possible to formalize hot in there, as far as I understand, or at least not in an easy way. Um, right, but uh, for the type theory with shapes that uh, Emily and Mike introduced, uh, it uses extension types, which I will talk a little bit more in detail uh, later, but uh, these extension types are sort of special in the sense that um, they rely on uh, judgmental equalities quite a lot. And it seems that uh, none of the proof assistants really support this, except for the cubical proof assistants that support specific variations of extension types that are uh, with, res uh, with respect to the cubical interval. And uh, so as far as I understand, this means that simplicial type theory can be formalized either with a lot of bookkeeping replacing judgmental equalities with uh, propositional ones, uh, or uh, in a new proof assistant, like we did, or in, in an extension of existing one. Uh, I should note that I think that it might be possible to uh, eliminate a lot of bookkeeping by introducing user-defined rewrite rules, for example, in Agda, but I haven't actually tried that and I do not know how far one can get if one were to try this approach. So maybe someone co can tell me about that. Um, so that is, uh, that is the context. Um, uh, hopefully that is uh, clear. And if there are no questions, then I will go into the little tutorial uh, in simplicial type theory. All right. So um, the uh, type theory for synthetic infinity categories of, uh, um, is an extension of Martin Love type theory with two important features, uh, extension types and tope logic. And now, more generally, uh, this, uh, this is about type theory with shapes, but for this talk and uh, for the near future, we're only looking at uh, specific, kind of, um, uh, specific kind of shapes that, uh, that, will, uh, th that are those uh, that are generated from the directed intervals. So the extension types, uh, the good thing about extension types is uh, they reduce bookkeeping and proofs and again, we'll see an example of that uh, in a moment. Uh, but the problem uh, from the implementation point of view is that they rely heavily on judgmental equality. So it should uh, hopefully compute very well. Uh, and moreover, uh, extension types may introduce local judgmental equalities, may bring these judgmental equalities into scope. So you can think of this as sort of bringing uh, as a um, uh, uh, whenever you get a thing in, in, in your scope, you have a new rewrite rule uh, in the scope uh, with this argument. And then the top logic um, is something that allows us to basically carve out shapes or uh, schemas for categorical diagrams. Uh, that's at least the main purpose for uh, synthetic infinity categories. Uh, and on paper, uh, this top logic uh, does not um, uh, does not uh, show uh, any proof terms, so we only state um, uh, state things, and we uh, that are sort of fairly obvious on paper, but uh, in a computer that requires a fully automated uh, constraint solver. Um, and so RZK is an experimental, and I will probably stress this several times in this talk, but it's very experimental proof assistant and probably contains some bugs, uh, but still it's an experimental proof assistant uh, and the language based on this uh, theory of Emily and Mike. And uh, so it's available by this link. So here's the GitHub repository and there's a, some website with incomplete documentation uh, for the language. And so in this section, I will go through some basics. Uh, and there is also a, a sort of satellite website uh, that has uh, that should have all of the um, examples that I show here that you should be able to uh, replicate if you would like to um, on your own. So uh, in the type theory with shapes, we have three layers. It's a three-layer type theory. Uh, without going into much 
uh, formal details about this. Uh, the first layer is an uh, intuitionistic layer that provides us with um, abstract spaces that are called cubes uh, in the theory. So this should not be confused with uh, a cu a cubical type theory in any way. So by cubes here, we just mean um, uh, an abstract space, basically. So for example, we can have a three-dimensional uh, um, uh, space like this, uh, a uh, like a literal cube, but it doesn't have to be. And then um, uh, in these cubes, we have points uh, that, we can, uh, that we can address. Uh, and then uh, on this, in these cubes, uh, what we do is we carve out shapes by providing restrictions using uh, a, uh, a formal uh, language of constraints. So just um, a fairly straightforward intuitionistic logic that uh, can be extended with uh, extra, um, extra um, formers. Um, and then all of that is just to uh, create a schema for a diagram. So this here is a sort of tr three triangles or three faces of a tetra tetrahedron. And then uh, what we want to do next is we want to map this into some type uh, such that each vertex essentially becomes a point in a type or an object in a category. Each edge becomes um, some sort of uh, path uh, in, in that type. And in this case, we're interested in directed paths or uh, morphisms or arrows between objects. And then the, the faces of the triangles would then become the, uh, the, uh, the commutative triangles. So some of these triangles that we get here are commutative and that those are exactly those that are uh, present in the, uh, in the shape here. Uh, so in, for this talk, we're only interested in uh, the directed interval, which is two, a directed square, uh, which is two times two, and directed Q, which is two times two times two. So two here is the directed interval. Uh, it has two points, uh, two distinct points, zero and one. Um, and um, next, uh, uh, we uh, we want to be able to construct different constraints uh, in this in these cubes. So the logic is fairly straightforward. Uh, we have top, uh, which selects all points in a given space, so basically gives no restrictions. You can think of this as logical true. We have bot, which is short for bottom, it selects nothing. You can think of this as false. We have intersection of shapes uh, or, or, or of topes. We, can, we have union of topes. Uh, and we have uh, the identity tope uh, or equality tope, uh, which selects uh, uh, only points uh, in a cube such that T and S are equal, where T and S are points coming from the same cube uh, or the same type of cube. Uh, and uh, Specifically for the directed interval too, we also have an extra uh, extra tope. This does not exist in any uh, possible shape, but we're interested only uh, for now in those that uh, that support this. The inequality tope selects to points uh, such that t is less than or equal than s. So here are some uh, very basic definitions uh, in RZK. Uh, so we can define uh, a one simplex as uh, a restriction on, uh, on the directed interval. Uh, and uh, here we do that by basically writing a function or a mapping from the directed uh, interval two to the universe uh, tope. And uh, the definition of this is just a lambda function that ignores the argument and says, well, uh, everything uh, satisfies, every point in this cube satisfies, um, uh, satisfies, is included in the one simplex. And so the image on the right, uh, it corresponds to this. So we have two points and we have uh, all the, a directed arrow between these two points. Uh, this is what the one simplex uh, looks like. Then in the uh, two-dimensional case, uh, we uh, we start with the two-dimensional uh, with the two-dimensional space. Uh, then and then we say, okay, give. Uh, we know that uh, a point in two-dimensional space is just a pair of points, uh, and um, then we uh, 
restrict them to uh, s less than or equal being less than or equal than t, and that gives us these uh, this directed triangle. So it has three points, uh, three arrows, and the filling um, uh, in the middle. And then uh, the three dimensional uh, the three simplex. Uh, is basically the same thing. Uh, we just uh, uh, use the uh, intersection of uh, of the two uh, in, uh, inequality topes here. So hopefully this is uh, fairly straightforward um, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, so we can do um, uh, one useful thing is uh, that is gonna be useful to us is horn. So we usually denote that with, with a lambda. And uh, it's a two-dimensional uh, shape, so it lives in two-dimensional cube, uh, and it only consists of the two uh, of the two arrows. And uh, uh, you can sort of see that these are this correspond to the shape that we would like to then extend to the two simplex to define composition in the future. Now, Nic here Nicolai, I show. Uh, yep. There's a question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can see it, or should I read it out to you? Um, so since Emily and Mike's model is simplicial in the directed dimension and not cubical, I'm wondering, does their theory and does RZK force you at some point to consider only simplices carved out from these directed cubes? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully understood the question, unfortunately, but uh, uh, I, I think not, uh, at least, uh, uh, again, at the moment, RZK does not allow user-defined cubes and topes, but uh, I had a sort of um, uh, a small project where I experimented with uh, doing that, like uh, allowing user-defined uh, cubes and topes and just doing the top logic in there. Uh, so that's, it's sort of a plan to add that in the future. But um, so the theory, currently is limited only to the directed interval because uh, there are just no other primitives defined uh, and uh, there is no way to define your own. But uh, the in principle, uh, it's not a restriction. So maybe in the future, uh, it, it would be more interesting there. Um, right, so in this slide, what I wanted to show um, is that we can actually explicitly show that uh, the, uh, the horn is embedded into the two simplex. And we can do that by saying that, well, actually, uh, this horn is defined not just uh, in an arbitrary two-dimensional cube, but more specifically in a restriction of that cube to the two simplex. Uh, and uh, so this uh, this sort of spec uh, specifies the horn uh, a little bit more uh, clearly, perhaps. Uh, and uh, this is also going to be useful later when we talk about extension types. So they have a similar syntax here. But then very often, uh, we just want to specify the shape that we map from uh, instead of specifying this uh, large uh, expression. So you, you might see uh, in the examples that I give here, uh, mappings from delta two to something else, to a top universe or to some type. Uh, and uh, remember that this is actually, again, uh, a tope defined in the two-dimensional cube. And we just are inferring that information implicitly from this. So this is just notational convenience, um, similar to the one they have in the paper. If I have a quick question. So yep. if I took the full square two times two, Mm -hmm. um, would the picture of that have a diagonal edge as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There is a there is a picture of the entire three dimensional cube with all the diagonals uh, somewhere in the uh, on the RZK website. But um, yeah. Um, right, so then uh, once we have uh, uh, these shapes, um, uh, we can talk about uh, types and terms. Now, uh, here, I assume that everyone is familiar with uh, with uh, types and terms. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the syntax uh, that uh, 
that is actually very close to Agda anyway, so it should be familiar to most people here probably. But uh, here's an identity type. So it's a dependent type that takes uh, the type A, uh, a an element in that type, and then returns something of type A. So this is the type of identity, and that this is its definition. It's lambda A X uh, maps to X. And uh, so we can omit the uh, name of the argument in the type if we do not use it. Uh, and just use it like this, for example. Uh, and we can also move the argument into the parameters before the colon, and that saves us some typing because now this is introduced simultaneously for the type and for the term. So that's just, again, notational conveniences that should be familiar from other proof assistants. Um, so here's, a, uh, uh, again, just another example of uh, a dependently typed function. So here we have a function flip that takes a function from A and B to a type family C uh, over elements in A and B and just flips the argument of that function. And uh, it works as expected. You just define it as a, uh, as a function that flips its arguments. Uh, and we can also do uh, a proof that flipping, uh, flipping a function twice um, is uh, the same as identity. So uh, if we have, if we start with a function f and then we flip it twice and we have to provide all of the arguments here, um, uh, then uh, th this is true. And we can actually prove that by reflexivity because here um, uh, all of the computation will, will take place uh, in the proof assistant and uh, it will be able to show that indeed we get f on both sides. So one thing to note here probably is that RZK at the moment does not have any implicit argument support. So all of this looks very, very explicit, um, which is um, uh, a good thing and a bad thing. So I've heard that people uh, like uh, explicitness when they learn stuff, but of course, once you uh, get used to it, it's uh, a lot of boilerplate and there is a plan to uh, support implicit arguments in the future. So uh, uh, in, apart from reflexivity and um, uh, being able to use the identity type and using reflexivity, uh, there is also a built-in uh, J eliminator, uh, just the usual one uh, that allows you to, to do induction over paths. And so in particular, we can, for example, define transport here. Uh, there are also here on this slide, a few conveniences like uh, local variables. So these are, variables uh, similar to uh, Lin's variables and Cox variables. And I'm actually not sure uh, if, if Agda has a similar, a similar feature. Right. So now we can get to more interesting types, to uh, specific examples of extension types that are useful in synthetic infinity categories. Um, OK. Uh, and uh, so the first thing is the type of arrows in a given type with fixed endpoints. So here, uh, remember that we already have um, uh, we already have a two uh, a one simplex, which is just two endpoints uh, and an arrow, uh, but that lives in the uh, in the toe player. Now we can always map that to any type, and that would pick any two points uh, and an arrow between them. Uh, in that type. Extension types allow us to also uh, fix uh, some part of that diagram, uh, which is, of course, very useful. For example, here, we say that given a type A and two points X and Y in A, uh, we can map from a one simplex to A uh, to pick up two points and an arrow. But we also, using this square brackets and uh, this notation, we restrict it to x when the uh, when we are in the left end point when we're at zero, and we restrict uh, the point to exactly y when we are at, at the right end point, so at one. So this makes this type an actual uh, sort of type of arrows in type A from x to y. I hope it makes sense. Um, now a more complicated version of this would be to define a uh, commutative triangle in A. So here, uh, the parameters are the type A, where everything happens, 
uh, three points in that type, these are the endpoints, and three home uh, and three uh, uh, arrows, so three values of home types. Notice that these home types are exactly the ones that we've just defined on the previous slide. And so uh, the, uh, the, the commutative triangle is undefined as a, um, uh, as a mapping from a two simplex to A such that we have the following boundary condition. So uh, the following um, uh, fixed, uh, the fixed boundary. Now notice that uh, here, uh, when t equals to two, uh, sorry, t two is equal to zero. It's uh, the uh, the the upper one, and t one is equal to one. This is the the right vertical one, and these two uh, these two arrows they do have an intersection uh, as shapes, right? And so these two terms uh, they are uh, they look different, and uh, in general they they are not the same, but Whenever we define this type, one thing that we should be able to check and uh, that, sh that should be checked by the proof assistant here is that these, uh, these two shapes actually are definitionally equal whenever on the intersection of these two shapes. The intersection of these two shapes is exactly the point one zero, which corresponds to this Y here. Now here, we actually know that this is true because F is a home type from X to Y. So we know that when T1 when t1 is equal to 1, this is the argument of f, we know that it's definitionally equal to y from the type information, from the, uh, from the extension type. And similarly, uh, g2, uh, g of t2, when t2 is equal to 0, we know that that is exactly y, again, because of the type of g. So the type information here contains this definitional equalities uh, um, that uh, make it possible for us to check that here, indeed, on the intersection of these two, uh, of these two uh, shapes, uh, we get definitionally the same value, and uh, so this is um, this is what we have to do. Uh, so here we have actually three shapes. So there's actually uh, three pairs uh, that we have to check, but all of them work out work out fine. And uh, this is the corresponding diagram that we have here. So x, y, z, f, g, and h are fixed. And uh, what this type corresponds to is to the filling of this thing, which semantically should correspond to this triangle being commutative. There's another question in the chat. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to postulate inequalities in, in the boundary constraints of extension types? Uh, so uh, uh, you mean uh, here on the left, uh, it can be any, uh, any tope. So any top constraint is allowed. Bottom, top, uh, inequalities, combination of those, uh, anything can be. Right. Can be. So in particular, in regards to the second comment, this would let you define semi-simplicial types, at least level-wise, as like a two simplices indexed by their boundary. You could have the boundary uh, in the definition of uh, yeah, two simplices. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could have uh, several. Uh, yeah, you could have uh, two, two, two simplices that intersect uh, by an edge, and that would also be checked, yes. Um, if, I, if I understood the question correctly, that's that's my response, right? So then, um, perhaps uh, one uh, interesting, uh, simple but uh, perhaps interesting theorem uh, about extension types is that uh, uh, we can sort of decompose them. And uh, here, I actually wanted to draw something, but I'm not sure that I will be able to. Um, Maybe, um, maybe, let me see. Um, there should be, no, I do not see how I can draw anything, uh, unfortunately. So I, I will explain this, uh, try to explain this briefly uh, and then move on to the next one. So uh, what we have here is we have, uh, we're working with a single cube I but this cube here is abstracted away. So I told you that we're only interested in two, two times two and two like uh, three dimensional cubes in this talk. But I guess that was a lie because we can also do abstract, uh, do some computation with abstract cubes and abstract shapes. So what happens here is I is just some abstract cube and you can think of a two dimensional cube, for example. 
And then uh, here we have several shapes inside of this cube. So chi is uh, just some part of that cube. And then phi, uh, psi is embedded inside of chi. And then phi is embedded inside of psi. So this is like, you can think of them as concentric uh, disks, right? Um, and uh, then what we do is we pick out um, a, uh, a family of types, well, in general here. So uh, we, we can map from, uh, from chi to u to pick out a type at, any po at every point uh, in this abstract shape. And then uh, for the smallest disk uh, or for the smallest shape uh, phi, uh, the, the smallest one, we also have a specific value uh, at each point uh, in that shape of the type x of t. And so then uh, what this co-fibration composition tells us is that if we have an extension of this disk of this small phi um, uh, or, or of this A that is defined on phi, and if we if we have an extension of that to uh, to the largest uh, possible uh, shape chi, uh, chi, then that is actually equivalent to first extending that to an intermediate shape um, and getting this type, and then separately extending that from psi to chi. Um, which uh, sort of uh, pictorially should make sense. Uh, so if we extend from 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 a small shape to uh, to a large shape, we can do that with an intermediate step. Uh, but um, I will have another picture on the next slide for this. Uh, but uh, you can notice maybe uh, one interesting thing here is because of the setup of the type theory. And because of these extension types, which give us definitional equalities, the proof of this equivalence is fairly straightforward, at, at least if you uh, explicitly provide all the data. So here we take uh, H, which is this extension, uh, as an input, and we provide two extensions. But you can see that both of them are actually the same as H. And that is because uh, all of this restriction to the proper uh, subshapes uh, is uh, checked uh, that it is valid to do that by the proof assistant. So we can just take the uh, the overall extension and just say that, yeah, we can just restrict it to uh, psi. Uh, and that would give us the first component here. And we can also just keep it as is, and we can just reinterpret it as an extension of uh, of itself but from, uh, from a, for a larger subshape. Uh, and uh, because, because we can do that, um, the, uh, the proof that this is uh, in fact an equivalence is uh, very straightforward. So going backwards, we just take uh, the second component forgetting about the first one at all. Um, and the proof that these are indeed uh, retraction and a section are just by reflexivity. So, um, I promised uh, a, 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 some picture. So um, you can think of this, uh, this theorem sort of telling you that if you have uh, a, um, an extension type uh, uh, or, uh, th that we can see as mapping from a two simplex into any type A, uh, so this is specializing to just, um, um, uh, just constant type families, uh, then you can see it as uh, if you repeatedly apply this theorem together with some extra small equivalences, then you can see this type literally equivalent to a uh, uh, to a uh, collection of points, then separately uh, the the arrows and the filling of the triangle. So you can take the triangle apart into the individual pieces and you can talk about them separately. Um, Right now, I should warn you that uh, just using this uh, this uh, theorem would would probably not be enough. Um, in particular, because the type A itself is not of the correct form; it's not an extension of anything. Um, yeah, and there are other like technical things, uh, but you can still do this equivalence in the same way that this uh, this theorem itself is done. By providing the data explicitly, it's actually all true by reflexivity, and you can just replicate the same, uh, the same 
uh, extension type and just restrict it to the proper components. Okay, um, are there any questions um, up to this point? Okay, good. Um, then uh, I will proceed to the simplicial hot formalization. Uh, uh, so talking a little bit more about uh, infinity categories, I guess. Um, and so this is uh, this is joint work with uh, Emily Rio and Jonathan Weinberger, and I would actually go as far as to say that most of the formalizations are actually done by them, and I was um, uh, mostly helping them figure out and navigate through RCK, especially considering that when we started this work, uh, there was no syntax highlighting and no editor support, so it was very um uh very interesting for them i'm sure um but and uh they, they've done uh, a great job here so we start by talking about sigil types which are uh pre-infinity categories and i think i will actually not get to actual infinity categories in this talk um because the main result can be stated about pre-infinity categories uh so uh we say that a uh, type is Siegel uh, or is it, or is a pre-infinity category uh, if um, for any three points X, Y, Z and any two arrows F and G, so basically for given a horn in a type, then the following type is contractible. So this type gives us the diagonal, the composition of F and G uh, and uh, a proof that it is a composition. So, uh, so it gives us an arrow from X to Z uh, and a proof that this arrow is in fact a composition by providing a uh, two-dimensional home um, uh, there. And then the restriction on, uh, on this thing, on this data being contractible means that uh, essentially the composition is unique. Um, and uh, the definition of contractibility here is uh, the usual definition of contractibility in homotopy type theory. So another way to look at the uh, Siegel types is uh, by looking again at the pictures. And what we're doing really is we are uh, taking, um, uh, so the, the data that was available in the previous slide is basically this blue data. And we're saying that it's contractible, but if it's contractible, it means that it doesn't have really any extra information uh, for us. So an alternative characterization would be to say that a horn uh, in a type is equivalent to a two simplex uh, in a type. Um, so we can just pack uh, package that uh, in this way. So uh, in one direction, uh, we can always do a restriction and just forget part of the data, but in the other direction, that's basically getting the composition. Okay. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to show you a series of pictures that explain how from this definition uh, on the previous uh, slides, um, how from this we get to associativity of composition. So we only at this point have demanded that composition exists and it's unique, but from the, uh, from the way that the type theory is structured, we actually get uh, associativity for free, um, right? And uh, to do that, uh, we do the following. So um, we start uh, by uh, talk, uh, talking about arbitrary triangles in a type and noticing that we can just do two triangles and merge them. And I, I think this is what Astra was talking about before. Uh, this is, uh, okay. except this is not an extension type. Here we are constructing um, a, um, uh, we are, we're trying to fill an entire square by only knowing how to fill a two simplex. And what we're doing here is we are just uh, inverting one of the uh, triangles and then merging them. And again, merging them makes sense here because on the intersection of these two triangles, these two definitions coincide because the intersection is when t is equal to s, but then uh, both of these terms are uh, definitionally equal when s and t are, def uh, are equal. So uh, now we can apply this uh, technique to a particular 
uh, uh, to a particular uh, composition witness. So we start with X, Y, and Z and two arrows F and G. Then if our type is Sigo, uh, we have a composite, uh, we have a composite. Uh, but we can now take this uh, triangle, uh, uh, this commutative triangle that witnesses the composition, and we can flip it and join with the original one to get a square. So this is um, this is nice um, nice picture. But what it allows us to do is now uh, this uh, this this two dimensional square we can see as uh, the product of two uh, one simplices. And uh, we can take this, uh, this map and we can carry it. So um, by carrying it, we're essentially saying that, okay, now uh, we, uh, we start with an arrow uh, and here RA is uh, just a map from uh, one simplex to A. So here F is just one arbitrary arrow in, in our type A and G is another arrow in the type uh, in the type A with arbitrary. So here the endpoints are not fixed. Uh, they're just arbitrary. And now it turns out that these uh, these arrows uh, uh, following from uh, another theorem that I do not mention here, uh, these uh, these uh, types of arrows from uh, from any shape or any simplex uh, into a single type, uh, these, uh, these these types are also Siegel themselves. Uh, there's not a very complicated proof, but I'm, I, I, I skip it for the sake of brevity. So this uh, bold arrow, uh, bold red arrow uh, is itself uh, an arrow that can be composed. Um, and uh, what we can do now is we can take three, uh, three arrows, F, G, and H, and these are the arrows that we are hoping to uh, do the uh, triple composition of, triple composite of, and show that the associativity works. And now because, uh, so we can construct uh, two, two of these uh, squares from F to G and from G to H, which give us these sort of two-dimensional arrows. Uh, but because they are uh, the, the space of arrows, the type of arrows is also, uh, is also Siegel, we can complete that uh, into a uh, into a uh, triangle, which in this case becomes a prism because we have an extra dimension everywhere. So we have a prism uh, that connects these two th these three things. Uh, and the next thing that we do is uh, we actually basically already have a witness of associativity. Uh, we just need to extract the important data from it from this. Uh, so we just cut our prism and just leave one tetrahedron from this prism, and uh, we can notice. So maybe it would maybe it would be clear from this picture. Uh, remember that this uh, this arrow from F to G on top it has F, on on the bottom it has G. So when we get to this prism here on the on the top from W to X we have F, right? Uh, from X to uh, to Y we have G. And here from Y to Z, we have H also. There is a duplicate of H there. And so if we just extract uh, the te tetrahedron along those edges and the main diagonal, then uh, this is our uh, tetrahedron that witnesses the associativity. To, um, now again, uh, to actually state associativity uh, uh, properly, we need to extract more data. So first of all, we can just restrict this tetrahedron to the main diagonal, uh, and that would correspond to uh, the triple composite of uh, F, G, and H. And then we have this uh, triangular face that shows that if we first compose F and G, and we get the composite of F and G by using the default uh, definition of uh, Isigo, uh, then this triangle shows that uh, if we compose F and, G, uh, F and G first and then compose them with H, then we get the triple composite. And then this triangle shows that if we compose uh, uh, G and H and then uh, uh, compose that with F, then again, we'll get the triple composite. Uh, so again, with uh, perhaps one more extra step, you can get uh, the, the actual SS, the excessivity uh, as your um, as you're used to. Again, 
all of this formalization and actually all of these pictures um, uh, should be available uh, in the uh, in, in the formalization uh, by the link below. Right. So um, I hope that was entertaining. And uh, so now I'm just I just want to state the uh, the the, uh, the the initial aim of the of the project uh, that um, uh, Emily and Jonathan initiated uh, was to formalize proof of the infinity categorical uh, Uneda lemma, and that has now been done uh, in the uh, speci the special repository for the Uneda lemma specifically uh, is in Emily's account here, and uh, there's a, again a corresponding um, generated documentation here, uh, and. Um, uh, so it, it, ha it has been completed uh, relatively fast, I would say, from uh, March 12th to April 17th. And again, I would like to remind you that at this date, uh, there was no his syntax highlighting or anything uh, really properly workable um, with the proof assistant. So it's developed uh, uh, very fast uh, from this date as well. And uh, right, so this is this is the statement of the unit dilemma. And you can notice here that it, it it's actually stated for the pre-infinity category, so it works. Uh, it works there. It also mentions something uh, about covariant type families, uh, which I will not get into um, today. Uh, there's also more details about this in a uh, in a preprint uh, that is available here. Right. Uh, perhaps I should note that. Uh, uh, the proof assistant was of some use uh, in the sense that it helped find a small bug um, with uh, concern with circular circular reasoning uh, in one of the propositions. So the proof worked in one direction, but the in the other direction, actually a different proof uh, should should have been used. Um, and if you're interested, there are details uh, here. Um, right. Um, so since then, uh, we have attended. Uh, in the previous two weeks, we have attended uh, uh, the uh, School on Interactions between Proof Assistance and Mathematics uh, at Regensburg. And uh, uh, we had received a lot of uh, new contributors to the formalization project. So we've sort of uh, forked the Yoneta project into a separate repository called S-Hot for Simplicial Hot. And uh, we have set out uh, uh, some issues on the GitHub, and uh, during the school we had a lot of contributions. That and even after the school, right uh, now we have uh, several people uh, contributing quite a lot. I think um, so. We we're very happy about that. And the aim in this larger repository is now to encompass more and formalize more results from synthetic infinity categories, uh, finishing the uh, uh, specifically the. Uh, the section on adjoints um, uh, from the original paper by Emily and Mike, uh, but also encompassing limits and colimics uh, from Cesar's paper and uh, synthetic fiber and binti category from uh, Ulrich Buchholz and uh, Jonathan Weinberger's paper. Um, maybe something else in the future. So um, I invite you to look at the all the wonderful people that have contributed to this. And uh, perhaps if you are brave enough also to consider contributing yourself. Um, okay, so uh, are, are there any questions um, at this point in the talk? Hoping not, okay. So now I'll briefly talk about RZK itself. Um, so, or at least about the infrastructure that we have for it. So again, once, RZK gained uh, actual users. Uh, it has uh, been developing very, very fast, I would say. Uh, and uh, we now have a VS Code extension and uh, an actual language server for RZK, which at this point maybe are, uh, have some basic support, but uh, it's expected to develop uh, significantly in the near future. And uh, the VS Code extension is primarily maintained by Abderrahman Abunegm, a student of mine. Uh, and um, we also have uh, implemented a bunch of uh, smaller tools to facilitate documentation for our formalizations. So we don't just want syntax highlighting for, for the code, we want it to also look pretty on the website. And I think mostly it uh, works. 
And uh, the way that we've achieved this is by leveraging the existing uh, uh, tools for, um, for Markdown. Uh, and we just support uh, literate RZK Markdown from the start. Uh, and um, yeah, there's of course uh, some syntax highlighting and some experimental features. There's definition anchors and diagram rendering. And again, maybe this will e extend in the future. Um, you can see more, there are some more things uh, available. And uh, so RZK Lang organization on GitHub contains all of those satellite tools. Um, and again, if you if you wish, um, we would be happy to accept contributions or at the very least uh, bug reports and uh, feature requests. Um, so RCK currently has a relatively primitive syntax and only has a few conveniences, but still there is a fully automated top logic solver, albeit uh, there should be an asterisk uh, sh saying that there are some issues with that. I mean, it works, but uh, it could work better. There are a few issues related to that uh, uh, in the repository. There are Cox style sections and variables that help a little bit, uh, but we uh, want more uh, organizational features uh, in the proper system in the near future. There is also experimental diagram rendering, and some of the diagrams that you saw in this talk are actually rendered automatically from the terms um, uh, although unfortunately not all of them, um, right. And, uh, we have VS code extension, which actually provides, uh, the, the basic minimum, uh, semantic highlighting, automatic checking in the background and, uh, some diagnostics and uh, even auto completion for some, some things. Uh, I should also mention that there is an online RZK playground, which you can use if you're, uh, if you only play with small files that, and you don't want to save them locally. Uh, for some reason, then uh, there's a playground. Uh, there's actually a playground available for each of the previous versions. So you can see how uh, different definitions work uh, or not work in different versions. Uh, and there are many, many features that are currently missing that we would like to add uh, on the on the side of uh, the on the side of the uh, type theory itself. Uh, we do not have any uh, universes, so we have sort of type and type, which is uh, not very nice and we could do better probably. Uh, we also do not have any user defined types or cubes or topes, which uh, would be nice to have in some uh, some point in the future. But perhaps most important are some organizational features and some nice uh, things like type and term inference that should make possible for typed holes, implicit arguments, and maybe also reasoning with chains of equations that should simplify uh, the, uh, the amount of code that we have to write because at the moment it's very, very explicit. Uh, and VS Code is also, we plan to uh, support better diagnostics and we're very inspired by Lin's info view and would like to bring something similar to RCK as well in the future. Uh, right, so uh, I would like to just uh, end here and say that again, RCK is a very, 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 very experimental proof assistant, but uh, it turns out that it's still usable and we have been able to formalize some infinity categorical results, in particular, the infinity categorical Uneda lemma in RCK. Um, and uh, we have started to formalize more. We have uh, a lot of new contributors and feel free to join. Um, and uh, yeah, and the RZK itself and the tools around it are growing. And again, we would appreciate any uh, feedback or help. Uh, all the links are here. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that's it. Great, thank you very much. So our uh, traditional method of applauding is to do it silently, visually. So we'll we'll do that now. And we have lots of time for questions. So please just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. I think I have a very basic one, uh, which I probably missed. Skegel types are defined to have uh, one horn fillers, right? Um, how would you get like two horn fillers without giving a separate definition? Oh, right. Yeah, uh, that also, uh, so that comes automatically. I mentioned this briefly, I guess, when when I said that uh, we can do this. So mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, sort of more general than a uh, two-horn, two uh, than a 
than a uh, three-dimensional horn filling, filling because it fills an entire prism, but then you can take, uh, I mean, it, it does have, a, as a part of it, it has uh, the, the horn that you would like to fill. So, um, uh, oh, that's sorry. interesting. Not so that's interfering, I think. I think it's hidden in the part where you said that when A is seagull, then arrows in A is seagull yes. again. Uh, so that's, maybe that's the step. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, the um, I was hoping to show you. Oh, okay, um, right. So in the formalization for seagull types, there is a seagull function and extension right. types. We can't and see. So there are proofs. Right now, we can oh. just see the slide. Yeah. You, you probably need to share your whole screen. Me, uh, yeah, I, I thought that that that's what I was doing. Mm. Now, now we can we, see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So in the uh, seagull, um, so uh, this is this is what the documentation looks like. This uh, seagull types, and then here we have uh, proofs for uh, seagull function and extension types. Uh, and the one that is interesting to us is is local horn inclusion extension type. And so is local horn inclusion tells us that we can extend horns uh, and fill it uh, to two simplices. Mm -hmm. But this one tells us that if we can fill uh, the uh, the uh, well, in this case, it's a type family at any point in uh, some other type, then we can fill uh, actually an extension type coming from there. So cool. uh, if um, if we map from um, from from a uh, from a simplex into a type and everywhere uh, everywhere the type is sigo, then uh, the type mm -hmm. of this uh, mapping is sigo itself, and that gives rise to this uh, three dimensional horn fillers and uh, any dimensional horn filler fillers. That's that's a feature of type theory, of course, not of the proof mm -hmm. system. <laughs> okay. Other questions? So I had a quick question. Um, and so you guys met your first goal, and you started to move on to formalizing other things. Has has there been mm -hmm. a need for higher dimensional cubes yet? Or are you still only requiring? Uh, let's see. What was the highest one that you said that you'd require? Oh, uh, the, the theory is not restricted to a, any number of dimensions, uh, and the proof assistant is also not restricted. It's only that uh, the there is no ability to define new uh, new primitive cubes, but you always have product cubes, so you can construct arbitrarily dimensional cubes. Uh, okay. anyway. However, the nice thing is that you can get away uh, with developing uh, lots of uh, theory in this uh, setting without actually having to go beyond, I don't know, dimension four. Uh, uh, well, I, I would I would say uh, it like the not, not that very... technically. Uh, sorry, oh sorry, Jonathan, I uh, interrupting you. Go ahead. Uh, I, Technically, in the code, you probably will not see dimensions higher than five, uh, higher than three explicitly. But uh, when you uh, sort of combine some of these things together, I think at least uh, I think somewhere in the in, in some proofs implicitly, uh, we we got at least to dimension five, but maybe higher. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, there's some similarities between cubicle type theory, um, where you pick out, you know, sub shapes of a of a cube, and you you talk about extensions. Do you get any of the other benefits of cubicle type theory? Um, so I think I I already know the answer probably. Like for example, you need to assume function extensionality. You can't prove function extensionality. And presumably, uh, then it follows. You can't prove univalence, right? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Is, uh, is there some potential to to get those benefits at some point? I I think maybe Jonathan can answer better here. But uh, as as far as I know, um, so no, we do not get function extensionality or extension uh, extensionality for extension types for free. 
but uh, we do get uh, some uh, functoriality and naturality for some of the proofs for free or almost for free. And I think Jonathan can confirm this. Uh, in particular, for the Uneda lemma itself, I think some of the things are fairly straightforward because, because we're using extension types. And uh, I would also mention that in the paper, um, uh, Emily and Mike actually outline a possible possible formulation of cubicle type theory uh, by providing proper, uh, you know, undirected uh, interval uh, theory as a as an extra shape, like uh, separate to the directed interval. And uh, theoretically, they could coexist, and we could in abandon the built-in identity type, the Martin Love identity type, and uh, just replace that with uh, uh, the path types from cubicle type theory. Uh, but um, I have not experimented with that at all. And I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, has done this. Um, and uh, moreover, cubicle interval is not part of RCK at, at this point, and there is no possibility to define it. So uh, we cannot play with it. Yeah, there is some work that merges these ideas uh, due to uh, Matt Weaver and Dan Licata, and uh, I think there's also some uh, implementation uh, of this um, uh, in, 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 some, in some capacity uh, uh, where they are concerned with, um, uh, with do, doing these cubicle uh, constructions in a, in a, in a bicubicle directed setting. I can post the link in the chat. Okay, more questions? Good talk. Thank you. I, I was curious, I don't know what this lean info view is. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. you seemed excited by it. So what, what is, is it, can you say quickly what that is and what, what you want from it? Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I probably cannot show you at the moment, but um, it's just a, a panel, uh, an interactive panel um, uh, that's next to your co formalization code, and uh, it's updated in real time. So wh wherever your cursor goes or whatever you're trying to prove, it shows you the current, uh, the local information, the goal that you're trying to prove or whatever else. And um, so, I mean, obviously you can just uh, have a feature where you, um, where you um, hover over some place or put a course or something, and then you have a pop-up there. But uh, having this constantly, like in Coq, but uh, you know, um, sort of a bit more reactive. I I, I think it's similar to mm -hmm. to the Cox, uh, you know, interface. But it's mm -hmm. uh, so they they've specifically uh, tailored this for VS Code, I think, and uh, it's it's very reactive. It's very fast, and I think that brings more uh, sort of uh, you know, it, it, uh, joyful experience into mm. communicating with uh, in this way. Yeah, that sounds good. Because like in in Coq, you can get that, but you have to evaluate to that point, and uh, it's not just it's not remembered. So you have to actually get the proof assistant yeah. to evaluate to that point, and some steps might be slow, so it's not as reactive as you're saying. On the other hand, one thing um, that I don't know if other proof assistants have this, but in Coq. Uh, we can generate documentation with that kind of hovering feature on the web. So the, the, yep. the proofs are laid so out, but the, as the, you hover through. Yeah. 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 Uh, the only feature that we have is you can click on the definition and uh, you will get a permal uh, sort of a link to that definition on the website, which is useful to reference it uh, from elsewhere. Uh, but uh, not much more than that. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, we have syntax highlighting some, at least to a certain extent, but not much more than that. So this is very uh, primitive at this point. Uh, ideally, yes, we would like to be able to hover and show the type, but also click and go to definition. Uh, but um, yeah, those, those are exciting features for the future. Lots of time if people have more questions. Okay, well, let's all thank Nikolai again. And uh, that's it for 
this week. Uh, next, and in two weeks, we have Felix Cherubini on October 19th. I hope to see you then. Wonderful.